So at one level, this is a very ordinary story. It's the middle of the summer and it's hot. Okay, of course it is. And yet there's evidence that something else is happening. Now versus just 50, 60 years ago, our summers are much hotter, much more intense. Airlines can't operate because the, um, they're unable to take off in such warm air. We're seeing a doubling in the number of emergency calls day after day after day of 100, 105, 110. That's cumulative and it takes a toll. The majority of Americans live on islands. They're just not the usual kind of islands that you're thinking of. They're urban heat islands. What's happening is heat is literally getting trapped in this urban center. So if you can think of a dome overarching a city, all the carbon emissions, whether from the buildings, from all the people within it, or just traffic, that plus air getting trapped within the tall buildings and the narrowly placed buildings, all of that is building and building and it has nowhere to escape. Cities can be sometimes 10 degrees Fahrenheit, five and a half degrees centigrade hotter than the neighboring urban, neighboring rural areas. But some areas see even more drastic differences. In Richmond, we found a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the coolest and warmest place at the exact same time during what would be called a heat wave. A New York-based study that measured temperatures between the South Bronx and Central Park, and there was a 20 degree difference during the daytime. The difference can be as far as 22 degrees Fahrenheit, even at nighttime. And that's actually uh, a big problem, especially because people need to recover from heat at nighttime when they need to sleep. No recovery time means people are at increased risk of health issues some of which can be deadly. You see upticks in kids with asthma having to go to the ER, older people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders ending up with complications. There is a literal physiological limit, right, which is that once you get above a certain threshold of temperature and humidity, you can't sweat. And you also can't just radiate heat because it's radiating back at you as fast as you radiate it out. At that point, you're really kind of incompatible with human life. We're seeing a doubling in the number of emergency calls because of heat issues. Uh, so even uh, Texas residents, folks that know it's hot, are still falling uh, victim to this heat. Once the temperatures reach about 35 degrees, our bodies are physiologically stressed to cope with heat. And today there are over 200 to 250 million people that experience temperatures of over 35 degrees every summer living in about 318 urban areas. So it's a lot of people experiencing it. By the middle of the century, uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the world's population will be in urban areas. I think there is a very high level of danger right now for vulnerable groups in particular. Poorer areas, areas with minorities, tend to have much higher heat indices, often significantly higher. Particularly areas that are farther north where maybe there's not as much air conditioning. I don't have no AC in my apartment, so I came here to cool off. It is too hot. I will have to wait for the sun to go down to go home. And that's the real issue is that the impact of rising temperatures is borne disproportionately by the poor and minorities and those who can least afford to pay for them. We saw this in the Pacific Northwest. Throughout the heat wave, Washington State reported more than 1,300 emergency room visits for heat-related illnesses. Officials in Oregon have reported 45 deaths related to excess heat in one county alone. Only about two-thirds of households in the Northwest have air conditioning because historically they haven't needed to have air conditioning. And, you know, now suddenly you're looking at, you know, days on end with temperatures, you know, above 100 degrees. Uh, that's when it gets really dangerous. According to the CDC, there are more than 67,000 heat-related emergency room visits every year in the U.S. And on average, more than 700 people die every year from heat-related illness. Those who are Black or Native American have the highest rates of death. I think all cities are impacted by it to some degree or another. Now versus just 50, 60 years ago, our summers are much hotter, much more intense, and heat waves are affecting us in times of the year when we wouldn't expect them otherwise. Unless cities can adapt, 
we will reach a situation where, at least in some cities, it will be unsafe for people to live there during the summer. One study published last year found that out of a thousand counties in the U.S., about 75% of them are impacted by the heat island effect. And the Union of Concerned Scientists found that many of the nation's largest cities will soon face dangerously high temperatures. Dallas and Houston, Oklahoma City, Little Rock, New Orleans, Tampa, Orlando, Miami, all of these cities could be looking at a month or more with heat index values of 105 or greater by mid-century. That's a really big change. As we start to get further and further above those, those maximum, those really rare temperature thresholds, the more and more dangerous those temperatures become, not only for public health, but also for things like infrastructure. Days of triple digit temperatures have caused roads to crack and pavement to pop loose across the Pacific Northwest. Crews had to close multiple lanes of traffic to repair parts of this highway. We see things like uh, rolling blackouts because so many people are needing to push their air conditioning beyond what they're kind of used to. That interplay between the resilience of our energy systems and various increases in climate hazards is a place that, that really warrants a lot of attention. An example being Hurricane Ida. When you look at New Orleans, right, where they hit landfall, most the, the heat killed more people than the, than the storm itself because the storm knocked out power and then it got really hot and then people died. When we think of uh, natural disasters or natural hazards, we usually think of dramatic ones like, you know, a hurricane, a tornado, a wildfire. But the highest deaths are recorded from heat stress Climate change turns up the background thermostat on what was already intense summer heat and kicks it up an extra notch. One study found that within 30 years, the heat island effect will raise city temperatures an additional 50% of whatever they experience from climate change. So if a city experiences two degrees of climate change warming, they can also expect an extra degree from urban heat. We are on a pathway to global warming of more than doubled 1.5 degree limit agreed in Paris. Climate scientists warn that we are already perilously close to tipping points that could lead to cascading and irreversible climate impacts. I would say we're already in, in extreme danger. All of the scenarios are scary. Even if we do everything and climate change stops today, we still will suffer from the consequences of everything that has happened until now. So the big question will be adaptation. Do city planners really start thinking about what they need to do to make cities more livable as temperatures are rising? Solutions are not optional, scientists say. They're a matter of life or death. There's really almost three ways of doing it. One is literally planting more trees, creating more urban gardens, creating green spaces. And the other then is to look at how do we either retrofit buildings, create living rooftops, um, paint the colors of the rooftops white. And then the third is really helping communities when there's a heat wave coming to alert those communities, but also to be able to to respond, whether it's providing water, whether it's checking in on people, and just taking care of people. If we do it right, we will have more livable cities. We'll have cities that are more pleasant to be in. We'll have more equitable cities. We've really come up with a, a really big menu of, of things to choose from. And too many places are looking for the one thing they want to order when it's really like, let's get one of everything and try it out. It's kind of up to us now to decide how many 95 degree days do we want in the future? <laughs> how many of those are we willing to, to live through before we say, you know, enough's enough?